Julia Roberts may be the most famous runaway bride from the 1999 film by the same name. Things turned out fine for Julia Roberts, but three real life runaway brides did not get the happy fairy tale ending that Julia Roberts did. In fact, some of them did some prison time and all of them had serious legal consequences. We'll start with Tammy Lee Hinton, who was arrested in Jackson, Michigan. Have you ever thought to yourself that if you should ever be arrested, you sure hope you're wearing your best clothes and having a good hair day? Perhaps that's what Tammy Lee Hinton was thinking. Or maybe she just wanted to save on wedding photography. Hinton was age 50 and wanted for a 2009 identity theft case. She was accused of using her son Wesley's identity to get a credit card, a phone, and utilities. Wesley was just 17 at the time. When he turned 18 and tried to get his own credit card, he discovered that his mother had charged $3,000 in utility bills in his name. He searched through her bills and his father said there were many in the son's name. Hinton headed to Florida, but years later she went back to Michigan to get married. Unlike the other two brides we're gonna talk about, Hinton did not actually run from her wedding ceremony. Not of her own accord, anyway. Hinton listed Florida as her home address, but authorities received a tip that she would be in Michigan to get married. And so after she said, I do, they told her she had the right to remain silent. Hinton was arrested after she said her vows on a Saturday in summer 2011 at City of Zion Ministries Church in Blackman Leone Township, Michigan. At least authorities waited until the end of the ceremony. And then Tammy Lee Hinton got one of the most iconic mugshots of all time. Police said they offered her the chance to change clothes before the mud shot. But why would she? She declined. A judge saw Hinton that same day, still in her wedding dress. Her fiance rustled up the funds and she posted $5,000 bail in time to make it to the reception. But Tammy Lee Hinton got the nickname Runaway Bride when she failed to show up for her arraignment that Monday the judge issued a bench warrant for her arrest. She said she was in the hospital and that might be the case since deputies trapped her down and arrested her at Allegiance Health the next day. Hinton was jailed for two months, which pretty much killed any honeymoon. The judge then let her out with a year's probation, but stuck her back in jail when she was, once again, a no-show. Hinton told the court that the man she married that day in summer 2011 left her and they divorced that same year. She added that she now has a new husband and is a minister. Our second bride is Tiffany Bray of Fletcher, Oklahoma. In 2012, she was engaged to Chad when she just ran. She told ABC News, I just was not happy with my life in general. I just felt like I couldn't breathe anymore. So when bride-to-be Tiffany Bray showed up at the courthouse in July 2012, it was not to get her marriage license. It was because she had disappeared for close to a month right before her wedding. She took her fiance's truck to run errands. At lunchtime, she called her fiance to ask what he wanted for lunch. But instead of picking up some fast food on her way home, she drove the truck to a pawn shop where she sold the gold heart necklace her fiance had given her. When that only netted her $60, she also sold her engagement ring. And then she didn't show up for a month. But 96 hours later, Bray sent her soon-to-be former fiance a text. Need help, somewhere in Lawton in dark room, white man, please, expletive, help me. Not sure I can use this again, by which I assume she meant the phone. Bray told ABC News' 2020 that it never occurred to her that the police would get involved. But Bray's fiance and her family and friends and Oklahoma authorities believed her when she said she had been kidnapped and needed help. Family members took off work to search for her and appeared on news shows begging for help finding her. Investigators quickly became suspicious of Bray's fiance, thinking he had harmed her. 
They gave him a lie detector test. But when investigators combed through a computer Bray had access to, they found she had been communicating with a man named Steve from Palestine, Texas on an internet dating site. Police tracked Steve's phone to a $40 a night hotel in Corpus Christi, Texas, where they found Tiffany alive and well. She admitted she had run away. In an interview with ABC, Tiffany said, you escape from something and don't realize how bad you're hurting everybody around you. So it's actually very selfish. Her former fiance says he was relieved on several levels. I was happy I wasn't a suspect anymore. Two years later, Tiffany Bray was sentenced to 60 days in jail for false reporting of a crime by faking her own kidnapping, plus a five-year suspended sentence for stealing her fiance's truck to run away in. The assistant DA said that her prison sentence, 60 days, was light so that the state could be sure Bray would work and reimburse the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation the $34,000 they had spent searching for her. But Tiffany's story does have a happy ending. She became close to Tommy Lewis, a family friend who had joined in the search for her. She started attending Tommy's church, and this time around, she showed up for the wedding. Our final bride-to-be hailed from Duluth, Georgia. Jennifer Wilbanks was just four days away from her wedding when she told her fiancé that she was headed out for a run. And run she did, all the way from Georgia to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Wilbanks and her fiancé, John Mason, were supposed to get married on April 30th. The caterers were set, the wedding dress had been fitted, and she had been fetted with eight different wedding showers. 14 bridesmaids and 14 groomsmen were lined up for the ceremony, and the couple invited 600 guests to the lavish ceremony. But the pressure inside Jennifer was growing. Afterwards, she would tell Katie Couric, I was stressed because I'm a perfectionist and I want everything perfect, and that was the hard part for me. 11 days before the wedding, Wilbank secretly bought a Greyhound bus ticket under a fake name. And then on April 26th, she went out for that long, long run, leaving her keys and her wallet behind. When she disappeared, the story became an instant worldwide sensation. Media coverage was intense as people around the world worried about the missing bride-to-be. Just like with Tiffany Bray, some people speculated that her fiancé had harmed her. More than 100 officers and several hundred volunteers searched for Wilbanks. Wilbanks' first mistake may have been running away from a guy so nice that he was willing to go through with the wedding even after she ran. But the mistake that led to her legal trouble was lying about what had happened instead of owning up to her cold feet. Three days after she left home, the day before the wedding was scheduled, Jennifer Wilbanks called her fiancé from New Mexico with a wild and completely false story about how she had been kidnapped and assaulted by a Hispanic man and a white woman in their 40s who were driving a blue van and packing a small handgun. Pretty specific. She then reported the incident in tears to a 911 operator. She told the 911 operator that she had been kidnapped by a Caucasian woman and Hispanic man. Law enforcement later said, if she had called and said, I got scared and ran away, I'm coming home, we would not be standing here. Wilbanks had cut her own hair to disguise herself, but she told authorities that the mysterious couple had cut her hair during the ordeal. Because she had crossed state lines, the FBI was brought in, and Wilbanks' story quickly crumbled, and she admitted the kidnapping was a hoax. So when Wilbanks showed up at the Duluth, Georgia courthouse on June 2, 2005, she had her fiancé with her, but they weren't getting the marriage license. Jennifer Wilbanks was indicted for making a false statement and making a false police report and could have spent up to six years in prison. Instead, she was allowed to plead guilty to a felony count of making a false statement to the police. Her devoted fiancé, John Mason, stood by her side at her sentencing, where the judge showed great mercy and sentenced her to just two years of probation 
120 hours of community service and required her to continue to seek mental health treatment. She also was ordered to pay the sheriff's office $2,550 on top of the $13,250 she already had agreed to pay the city of Duluth, Georgia to cover overtime costs during the search for her. Authorities estimated they spent $50,000 looking for her, so the amount she had to repay was generously low. Near her home, friends and family had purchased a billboard to raise awareness during the search for Will Banks. Somebody put a giant yellow sticker across the sign saying, case solved, cold feet. In the end, Jennifer Will Banks and John Mason did not get married. Will Banks ultimately married someone else, but the couple divorced 11 years later, according to People Magazine. And the Harvard lawyer Lee moral of the tale is, if you get cold feet before your wedding, just say so. And whatever you do, don't pretend you really got kidnapped. Be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.